Okay, let's get down to uh, the uh, the business uh, boxing history. Now, I'm looking forward to this because uh, it's about the colourful characters our, our, our game attracts. The colourful characters that come out of the woodwork historically mm. uh, from it being run by the mafios, uh, historically by the, the, the fact that blue chip companies never wanted to get involved with boxing. And times have changed mm -hmm. massively over the years where you've got Nike, you've got Adidas, you've got TV companies backing up around the front and the back pages of the newspaper. But the dark side mm -hmm. of our game uh, has always been that it's probably slid out, slid away, uh, or done on the cover a lot more. One fighter <laughs> that I that really brought that to my attention, one I can connect with, was Michael Nunn, Michael second to Nunn. This guy was an absolute mm -hmm. badass of a fighter. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And he ended up, ended up inside. He ended up doing hard time, um, filling the gaps. Well, you know, he was a terrific middleweight. He was undefeated when he won the title. He beat all the contenders. He held one version of the championship, I think, simultaneously when Duran was middleweight champ at the same time. He never saw him wanting to fight him. None of the big guys from that era with Tommy Hearns was still around. I mean, Michael Nunn was a dominant fighter. And then he got involved some insanely with the drug trade and, and uh, like a local gangster in a, in a small Midwestern section of the United States went away for like 20 years. And here he is resuscitating himself. And he was up at the Boxing Hall of Fame last weekend, more or less trying to solicit people to get him nominated for the Boxing Hall of Fame. So wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, wow. yeah, shaking his smile. He had a great smile and great personality. And I don't know if he's learned by his mistakes, but we do. Uh, again, this is an amoral business, John. No, we'll forgive anything as long as somebody's making a profit. And I yeah. guess we judge got in the ring but yeah that's a tragic case that he was away for as they say nearly two decades and so tell, me, so, so tell me if i got his crime right or wrong in america they have the, the three strike rule uh so he'd been <clears> done for two two minor offenses and then he got done for a uh uh drug solicitation or some kind of drug deal uh, and then, then that's where he got in for the for the big one. That's where he got three strike rule is you get in uh, life. Is that right? Well, that's we came in these very draconian drug laws some years ago. And depending on the states, how how much they enforce it, there are federal drug laws, and we've eased a lot up on marijuana, but heroin's still very strong. And that's the thing you brought up, John. Okay, he got arrested. Maybe some people felt that the conviction wasn't justified, or maybe it was too strong a sentence, but. He had two other prior offenses and who knows what he did as a youth. You know, these guys come from back tough areas, but the amazing thing is they get into making hundreds of thousands and millions. And yet they're still behaving the way they were when they were juvenile delinquent of 15, 16. It doesn't change their character. They don't get Complete, out of that Completely baffled me. I remember doing a dinner with my, uh, Mike Tyson and he was mm -hmm. talking about uh, a few weeks before he boxed Trevor Burbick for the world title. Him and his boys are still going upstate mugging people. He said, and I'm like, what? And this guy said it was just a rush. It was a thrill. It was, it was just, that's who he was. You know, the things he did. And these guys are earning ridiculous, ridiculous money. But I'm quite sure there's more colourful characters in the past of our game that you could fill in the gaps with. Well, if we're calling colourful, felonious characters, then you've got a whole slew of them. And of course, the guy who's the most outspoken or, uh, the most uh, uh, publicized is Don King. You know, nobody yeah. has risen the depths and risen higher than he has in terms of success and, and notoriety and money. Uh, Don King was another one who was convicted and put, he was a bookmaker who made illegal bets and things like that, which was tolerated. And then he ended up murdering, I think not one, but two people went to prison, wow. reform came out. But again, if he went into any other organized sport, football or baseball or basketball he would never have been allowed to buy a franchise you know he would never pass the background check or what the criteria is but he came into boxing and he's no john the most successful boxing promoter certainly of his time and certainly among those of all time let's go really far back back in time and you're talking to like to don king i'm quite sure they're very very uh there's probably ones that have been probably not as loud and as obvious the boxing at one point was was run by the mob. The mob actually controlled who'd win or lose in a fight. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe our sport has not benefited because, because individuals benefit. That's why 
it's just taken until the modern era that that that's why blue chip companies want to get involved because because now it's 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 it's, it's, it's probably one of the few sports where they want to get they'll get involved with tis, uh, tennis basketball baseball everything mm -hmm. but boxing has been mm -hmm. the last last ones for for cat because of characters like this well that's it because the, 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 you know we've had any individual soccer players and individual baseball players and basketball players who've done crazy things there are basketball players who've been shot and murdered there's baseball players who've committed crimes over the years uh there's one benny kauf was a uh, baseball player in america in the early 20th century he was arrested for armed robbery so certainly it happens but boxing the whole focus is on the individual so you know if you're defending a title john and you get sick the fight's off they don't say we're going to bring in a substitute champ well now you can have a substitute champ but you know mm -hmm. you you face it all on the main event if Usyk or joshua falls out that card is canceled you know so you 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 the, the the emphasis is so much on the individual and if he does something wrong it's it the total spotlight is right there i mean we go to tyson most famous boxer of, of his generation another guy he had a lot of endorsements pepsi cola and then it came out that he beat up his wife robin Givens. they canceled then he gets the rape conviction and that just about buried any possibility of getting any kind of endorsements although as you notice tyson most popular fighter in the world again mm -hmm. most boxing celebrity i get calls i don't know if you do john but you know getting people to show up and there was a show in Arabia, I think about two years ago with the Sourlands and they had in their contract, they had to use Holofield and Tyson or either or. And we got Holofield to come over. They offered Tyson $300,000 to make an appearance for one week and he turned it down. So that makes me believe that he's getting so much income that he doesn't have to get $300,000 offer, which to most of us be a phenomenal income for the next couple of years. Turns it down. Especially Popular. Especially if you've been a fighter and you've been retired and you're still able to command that kind of money years after you box. And, and, mm -hmm. and usually when you hear these kind of stories, you hear these stories of fighters ending up in the clink or uh, years after their, 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 their career is over because they're trying to find that rush, they're trying to find that something, that desperate, that desperation, that, 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 that DNA they needed to fight needs to be fulfilled that that thirst needs to be quenched so mm -hmm. usually getting active fighters that get themselves in trouble is yeah. probably not the norm it's the ones that are just at the back end of the career so mike tyson he mm -hmm. he did it whilst he was fine but still succeeded to to make so a hell of a lot of money yes and he did the turnaround you know after he got out so he had this remarkable transition from the the guy like you said the testosterone flowing but somehow he channeled it after after boxing, where he seems not to have been getting. I mean, now he's selling a big salesman of marijuana. Not a salesman, he owns marijuana farms. And, mm -hmm. and now that would have been legal 10 years ago. Now he's making millions on it. And yet, you know, he was in a half a dozen motion pictures. He's always on call. I mean, Mike Tyson could be making a personal appearance for hundreds of thousands of dollars every day of the week. So the rape charge. Uh, which was a bit controversial. And if you recall, John, he was arrested and incarcerated subsequent to that on another uh, thing. He was just filmed having a, a fight in an airplane with someone. I'm not a big fight, but some guy was harassing him and he either slapped the guy or something like, dismissed. Nobody did anything. It's sort of like, well, that's Mike Tyson for you. It's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Become this lovable, embraced by all. I know here in the UK, unfortunately, he's not. He's not allowed to to travel out here to the new UK because I think if you've had a, a criminal a criminal conviction, uh, you can't you can't you can't you can't travel to it. I'm, I'm quite sure vice versa going to America, which is why his tours stopped here and and in those tours I gather he was pulling like 250 grand a, a week uh, when he did these things. Let's go even further back. Uh, there was a fighter called Steve Heron, heavyweight. Do you remember? Yes, Steve he was Heron. A, yeah, fighter out of Texas. And nobody seemed to know he was living a double life. He was a, this is incredible. This is the most incredible. There's two stories that bring up him and a fella, Henry Snowflake. But Heron was a guy, a pretty good fighter. And all of a sudden they found out not only was he a serial killer, but he was a transvestite serial killer. Just yeah. version that day. He would get, get, pick up men or whatever and then murder them. And they finally un. Uh, well, I don't know, unsheathed him or whatever they did. They they caught up with him and he was arrested, I assume, 
well, Texas does have a death penalty, but for whatever reason, he may be pleaded it out and he's serving life in prison without the possibility of parole. Yeah, and then, well, and that's when you, you just think to yourself, wow, they, 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 I wonder if you've just got to have a certain DNA to, to, to be able to get in there, fight like hell. And, and, mm -hmm. and because when you fight, when you're fighting, when you're a good fighter, you've got to commit life and solve it. How the hell have you got time, the energy to go out to do all the rest of this? Harry, Snowf Harry Snowflaker, uh, another, yeah. another heavyweight as well. He was a, a, a young up and coming uh, potential uh, world mm -hmm. beater. And I'm getting electric, mm -hmm. uh, electric chair in the 1940s. Yeah, I mean, he was a good fighter out of the Buffalo area in uh, northern New York, uh, near uh, Niagara Falls, and uh, the prospect. Then he, you know, sort of faded a bit. He had some operations where they said he might have gotten addicted to, to, to the morphine that they used to, uh, as the, uh, uh, to, so he wouldn't feel the pain. And uh, then he fell into hard times, and he was involved in a robbery and shot and killed someone. He was the, one of the last people ever executed and the only boxer i know to have received the electric chair and he went wow. this kind of gleefully to his death but you don't know this there may be a predisposition for this in their dna as you said and then maybe the pounding they get fighting releases something and then it sets off it in the brain a yeah, psychiatrist years ago we talking about boxing and this is not to to put fighters in any kind of a uh, to condemn anybody they said it's very unique with the two most powerful emotions in people are love and hate and prostitutes and boxers, when the bell rings, they have to they have to separate themselves. The prostitute has to say, I can make love to anybody and separate the emotion of sex and love. And the boxer says, the bell rings, I have to go out and try to obliterate this person. And then when it stops, say, just go back to normal. Well, some of them, it's not a sport. Some of it just, I guess, catches onto the brain and mm -hmm. they just can't. You know, maybe there's that violence that drives into boxing. Not like yourself, not like 99.9% .9 of the boxers who go in because you're athletes. But there's something that brings into the boxing and it, it manifests the violence where they can get out of with it legally. But the switch may, doesn't... Yeah, and I may, that's what I'm saying, maybe, unfortunately, because that's what it's like an actor trying to get out of character. Maybe, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you've got some fighters that, that when they, they are in fight mode, it's hard to just not be that person in the real world. Uh, there's a fighter that killed his wife. Uh, I can't remember, my goodness, it, uh, his, his name slips me. Um, but I'm quite sure there's many fighters that have been in that situation where they just can't separate characters. Well, Edwin Valerio recently, remember, he's an undefeated fighter with all yeah. knockouts, murdered his wife and then killed himself. Going back early in the 20th century, a string, well, he had a play champion, Stanley Ketchell, who was murdered yeah. by... Uh, the boyfriend of a woman that he was having uh, daily and and then subsequent to him, the next champ, Kid McCoy, he shot and killed his wife and then killed himself. And then his successor, Billy Papke, who had beaten Ketchell, he murdered his wife and killed himself. Wow. So there's this homicidal, you know, again, it's a very, very rare. So Carlos Monzon is another one in our time, yeah. you know, he murdered his girlfriend and then was killed in, an, in, in a car crash. I mean, there seems to wow. be some, there's an endemic violence. But you see it in some footballers in America, too. It's, I don't know, maybe it's disproportionate testosterone running through their bodies that they can't control. Curly Shatchman, uh, Curly Lee, do these names yeah. sound familiar? Yeah, well, these are not heavyweights again. You know, a friend of mine, Norman Henry, was in boxing for 50 years. He said, there's something different about a heavyweight. They're always the biggest guy in the school. They're either getting picked on, or pointed out, but they stand out from everybody else. You're in a school with kids in the first or second grade, and you look like somebody from the sixth or eighth grade. So they're always drawn out. So when they go in, they, they're, they're standing out from everyone else. And maybe that affects them. But Curly Lee was another one, had a beating in a fight and, and went out and, 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 and murdered people. Uh, hatchet Man Shepard, I mean, Hatchet Man, because of his power is a punch, but he actually did take a hatchet to his family. So it's real, and, you know, went away for a long time. And I think it was eventually released. There's another fight of note, James Scott, if we remember. He actually fought him mm. in prison. And the story of James Scott is when they released him, he was driving a car and the taillight was out. And the guy said, did we have this as a report of this stolen car? And he said, I did not steal this car. And the policeman opened up the trunk and there was a dead body. So Scott said, I admit it. I stole the car, but the body was in there when I took it. <laughs> wow. Well, it didn't help. <laughs> you make back your mind up. <laughs> Wow, mate, 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 your mind. That is that is crazy. And the thing is with, with fighting and fighters, 
when you've boxed all your life and when you've committed yourself to it, the problem is once you finish, it qualifies you to do nothing apart from stand at the door of a club, be a coach, mm -hmm. um, um, yep. uh, because it's, it's not, um, the skill isn't that transferable. And, and there's a frustration yeah. because it's like, you, you know you're good at something, but yeah. there's no way of, nowhere to apply that skill, that, that, that success, that, that something you're good at. And so I'm, usually what I find was that most fighters, especially at the top tier, when they finish boxing, it's the first five years of retirement is when they hit the headlines. And I don't know if it's just a boxer for, or for sportsmen or women. They're trying to find that rush, that buzz, that, that something that, that, that turned them on to try mm -hmm. and to quench that thirst, be it drugs, be it drink, be it violence, mm -hmm. be it whatever. Mm -hmm. It's always the mm. first five years of, oh, okay. of somebody walking away from the sport. Yeah, I guess that's transitional period. I mean, you're a great example, Johnny. I mean, you went into broadcasting, but very few guys are as loquacious, speak well. You know, you have to have that gift to do it, to understand and, and be able to handle the camera, handle the audience. Lennox Lewis is another example. But I've seen many boxes they put on that. Just because they have fame as a fighter, they put a microphone in front of them. They just don't express themselves. You know, that it's a different field to transition in. But as you say, unless you become into broadcasting or become a, a trainer, few become managers. Where do they go? Because they're not getting the endorsements like a, a famous baseball player or a footballer might or something like that. You almost never see them on that. So, in, uh, so unless you discipline yourself to have a business going in or, you know, it's a great life. You don't have to, you know, go to work every day, but transitioning out of that. It's, it's very, very hard for a lot of guys. So, Don, um, I, I forgot to mention, uh, you talk about characters that really hit the headlines. Uh, Achibuchi. Um, yeah. Do you remember him? Oh, yeah. He was a great big Nigerian that came over here and he beat uh, all the top contenders, water himself up into the number one spot. And then he was uh, arrested for assaulting and, and raping a prostitute in Las wow. Vegas. And Get him. He started battling it out. While, while, while being an active fighter, or was it this a back end of his career? No, he was the number one contender for the title on the brink of fighting for the world championship. So this is how far he had progressed. He had beaten up his trainer, who was a great fighter, Curtis Cox. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Cox probably a better fighter than Ibi Abuchi, but it was only a welterweight, and he was a 70-year-old welterweight, and Ibi Abuchi was a 25-year-old heavyweight. Uh, and he just had, they told me in the gym, he just had a history of being violent with everyone. And it manifested himself on this situation where he had a prostitute. And the story was that he wanted to give the prostitute a check. She says, I don't take checks. And his wow. reaction to that was up uh, mercilessly. And her screams brought in uh, other, the attention of other uh, guests in the hotel. And they called the police, broke down the door. And uh, after four or five police tried to sub subdue him, they tried to finally took him to prison where he apparently is still now, hopefully for any other young women who are out there might be wow. future. Yeah. How, how long ago was this? This goes about 20 years ago, but I'll tell you how boxing works is promoter Cedric Clushen did everything under the sun to bail him out and get him fighting again. Hired lawyers in this. So I guess the morality didn't affect the promoter when he thought there could be a buck made with anybody. And uh, that's one of the unfortunate things, you know, it's like I say, the punishment, yeah, but if they can make a dollar, people are willing to overlook it. Say, so Wim Crusher, he was uh, my promoter for a short while. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. Tony uh, Ayali, uh, Jr., uh, yep. another one. One of the greatest unsung heroes in, in, in well, start one of the greatest unfulfilled careers in boxing history. He was undefeated, almost all knockouts. He came from a family in, uh, in Texas that also produced uh, Tony Ayala and Paul Ayala. And... Uh, he just had a nature of violence uh, and he raped the woman. Again, he was arrested. He was allowed out and he raped the woman and went into jail where I believe either he's passed away or he's still in prison. I, I'm not sure what became of him. I, I, I don't know. But I will tell you this. It was recalled to me that the father was one of the most violent people ever. Uh, Tony Ayala brutalized and beat his children, beat Tony, beat Paulie, beat uh, uh, Mike Ayala. And uh, he just had a terrible history of abuse, I believe, to his wife as well. Wow. That, that, you know what? And, and unfortunately, 
you know, when you see that in it within a family, they, they think it's the norm and not realising it's actually far from it. They're preconditioned. Well, yeah, just to interject, there's a family, the Waters, and one of the sweetest, finest young men, one of the best boxers and human beings I've ever been involved with is to- uh, Troy Waters, who was a top junior middleweight contender. I remember. For the- I remember. I remember oh. more. He was one of three brothers and a sister. The father, Seth Waters, was a monster. He he had, uh, you know, he he had incest with the sister, continually raped her. So one of the brothers, Dean Waters, went out and shot him and killed him. He went to prison for a short time, but then it came out that the father had abused all the sons and the daughters. So, you know, a lot of this has coming from a violent background that's, you know, been instilled in these kids of family abuse. And this is what we're overlooking. So it just doesn't spring from nowhere. I don't know what I'd be Abuchi's background, but I would bet there's somehow there's been, you know, very, uh, violent abuse towards him as a child. And he may have grown up and that was just that he harbored it. Don Chilling. Chilling information, but thank you. Thank you, sir.